Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Sam's Healing Podcast. If you're tuning in by video, then you already know we've got a veteran who comes in quite often, one of the listeners' favorite, and that is Dr. Jill Manning. So, Dr. Jill Manning, it is always awesome to have you back in. Thanks for coming in. Likewise, it's it's always a pleasure. So I've had a lot of new people follow the podcast. We're now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So I've gained a, a large new following of followers. So maybe in review, if you could share just a little bit about who you are, what you do. I didn't want to mess it up. I figured you'd do a much better job. So why don't you tell everybody, especially the new listeners, who you are and what you do, and maybe just a tad bit on why you do what you do. Sure. So I'm Dr. Jill Manning. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I've been involved in therapeutic work for I mean, 25 years. I specialize in treating and supporting those dealing with betrayal trauma, and that's been an area of clinical focus and research of mine for well over two decades now. So um, I'd want people to know I wear various hats within that space, including research. Uh, and really, I, I do what I do. I This calling found me. And and, and I am somewhat unique in the field in that my story isn't that I myself was sexually betrayed. I was a clinician and this topic found me. It kept coming up and up with um, and, and specifically pornography, Internet pornography was really the gateway through which I came into this field uh, with working with children and also elderly people that were struggling with that. And then my interest in social justice, women's mental health really naturally gravitated toward this field because pornography is the number one way in which people are being betrayed emotionally and sexually in relationships today. So that that is how I came into this. I'm from Canada originally, but based in Colorado now. We're not going to hold the Canadian thing against you. I can assure you of that. Just kidding. Even in your intro, intro, you drop little nuggets of information and you are definitely one of the most likable. But whenever you come in a simple intro and you're delivering sound bites of critical information for both untra for both unfaithful and betrayed. So thank you for that. Today's topic can be a little bit controversial for those of you that are listening on Spotify or Apple, or for those of you that are watching on YouTube. On behalf of myself and Dr. Joe, we are thrilled that you are here. Today's topic is going to be a little bit controversial, and all I'm going to ask you, especially betrays, is to take a deep breath and process the information, because Jill has done some phenomenal research. Her information is based upon data and real-time experience from people that she's worked with for over two decades. I've been doing this for the most part, close to two decades. And a lot of our thinking flows the same because we've kind of grown up in the same relative generation. And so if you are an unfaithful, I'm going to tell you that if you take any of this information and weaponize it, it will backfire in your face massively. And I mean that graciously, but as a former unfaithful, this information can actually change your life and your partner's life. And finally, if you're a betrayed, take the information, process it, think it through, because it is going to challenge some of your thinking. Having said that, today, Dr. Jill, you chose this topic. I was just enamored by the opportunity to discuss it with someone of your caliber. And you talk about how the impact of snooping can really be harmful for the betrayed. So why don't you talk a little bit about what snooping is, and then we'll head off into the deep waters of it all. Sure, thank you. And I, I really appreciate you giving space, Sam, for this topic, because in my professional opinion, it's not discussed enough. And the majority of betrayed adults are engaging in it. And we're not giving people tools and understanding about why this is going on. And so my disclaimer before I jump in is I, I think today will be equal opportunists for offending both <laughs> betrayed and, and unfaithful. That's certainly not the intention, but I really would ask also for people to be open um, on both sides of this equation, because when we've got a controversial topic, I think it can crack open the most opportunity for healing if we'll stay open and, and really take it in and metabolize it. So 
Snooping is a shorthand word for looking or prying in a meddlesome manner. That's really the dictionary definition. Kind of the lay, the lay way of explaining that is it's basically a way of trying to get information in an un, indirect way without confronting someone or something directly. We're trying to go through the back door to, to get information we believe we're entitled to or are deserving of. And it's, I mean, let's be honest, on behalf of every single betrayed male or female, it is understandable, the desire, the want to, the, the need to, and it's understandable why they would want to do it because unfortunately we unfaithful don't want to give up the information. A lot of us anyway, we want to hide it. We want to delete it. We want to lie. Unfortunately, we, we will do anything and everything to cover it up. So that brings me to the next question is why do the trades now that we can remove the shame of it? Cause we understand that we all do it. Why do people snoop? So it, it, it's a self-protective instinct. I think it can start out pretty uh, naturally and instinctively, truly. I, I don't think most people go through a thought process of, I'm going to wake up and snoop today because right. of a hunch I have, right? I, th I think it's far more impu impulsive and instinctive than that. And what I want to offer is a validating statement and offering right at the outset is people snoop because they're in pain. Yes, exactly. Okay, we're in pain. There's something painful that we've sensed in our gut or we've discovered or we've learned or something's not connecting and it's out of pain uh, that we are seeking information to be reassured, to get information we believe uh, will somehow protect us that we can act on in some fashion. So I think pain needs to be an overarching validating uh, container for this discussion today. And as a caveat to the unfaithful, look, if you would tell them everything, they wouldn't need to snoop. And mm -hmm. I know the rebuttal is, Sam, do you understand? Uh, I absolutely understand. Mm -hmm. But if you're not willing to give them the information, a great buddy of mine, Rick Reynolds, would say, as long as you're controlling the flow of information, we've got a problem. And while there are boundaries and guidelines to how much the betrayed needs to know, male or female, it's understanding that pain is the driving force. And so when you talk about, you know, pain is the driving force, why do people snoop? What does snooping really accomplish? Is, is it all bad? Is it some good? Is it something that, and we'll talk more about how to not do it, but in terms of what is, what is it accomplishing? Maybe let's talk about that first. Sure. So it's important, I think, to break this into two categories, short term and long term. In the short term, and when I, I define short term by hours or days, maybe one or two weeks, I'm talking really like, let's narrow this in. In a very short period of time, many people report to me that snooping behaviors, and we'll give some examples of that in a moment, uh, initially can evoke sense of empowerment. You know, he, he or she is not going to dupe me again. I'm on top of this. I'm on it. And it's protective to try to protect ourselves from, from harm um, or, or betrayal, right? Or to confirm that betrayal so we can right. act. So there's initially, initially a sense of action, protection, and, and it can evoke temporary or sometimes false sense of reassurance. The right. self-protection self piece. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. The internet just jumbled a little bit. The self-protection piece, I think, is massive, right? And how do you help the betrayed? I mean, they're trying to self-protect. So at some level, it's kind of like, hey, Dr. Jill, Sam, I got my badge of self-protection. What am I supposed to do? So how do you help them just with that little unique element? Well, to, to validate and help them understand why that's go what's happening, why they're engaging in that. Right. I think can be really 
really helpful. Now, where it jumps track and becomes problematic is when it gets into long-term snooping and it becomes a pattern. That's the key word I want people to take away, is when it becomes a pattern or a lifestyle and a dynamic in a relationship, now we're in a whole other territory that really does harm long-term. When I say harm, harm to the relationship and harm to the nervous system and and both individuals. Now I can hear in the background already people saying, well, the harm was the betrayal. Yes, absolutely. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, for those of you that might even be a little bit aggressive in your commentary behind the scenes, absolutely that was the harm. That was the entry point. And the unfaithful would, we could do this for hours. The unfaithful would say, well, if you did X, Y, and Z, I wouldn't have done this, right? We could do that for hours. But as you are speaking to the pain of it all, please elaborate on that, because that's a, a wonderful point that you just made. And we are not, to be clear, making false equivalency between betrayal of a monogamous relationship and snooping behavior. But but there's also some buts and some qualifiers to that, too. Let, let's mention for a moment some examples of snooping. Uh, that could be searching someone's device. It may even be a password protected work device uh, where it gets into ethics of getting into information that it truly is not the partners to, to have. Reading personal journals or therapeutic workbooks, hiring private investigators, recording someone without their knowledge, hidden cameras, stalking, spying. The, the, the list is long and, and we'll touch on this more later. And I do want, it's important, ethically, I feel a duty to say some of these behaviors and types of snooping are illegal, depending on the state or country you live in. Not all of these are legal, even if we feel justified in engaging in them. So that, that's the first qualifier that I think needs to be given some attention. Um, but, the, but the harm, when we're engaged in a pattern of snooping, we're going into a repeated pattern of going through the back door to try to get information. My fear, Sam, is that we are, without addressing this head on, we're enabling people to think it's okay to engage in that. And people are getting stuck in very immature, ineffective, uh, unsatisfying relational patterns because it keeps people in a state of alarm. Their nervous yeah. system stays stuck in a fight or flight response. And in that fight or flight response, they're not able to get grounded enough to really ask themselves some important and uncomfortable questions. For, for example, why am I staying in a relationship where I chronically mistrust someone or someone is giving me chronically reasons <laughs> to feel compelled to snoop. So I see people staying in a very avoidant, anxious pattern and they stay stuck, they will stay stuck. Now the biggest take home message I want to give to the betrayed today is please think very carefully about snooping because I believe and my observation is that it's doing their work for them. It over functions. We're wanting, most people I meet say, I want to be in a mature, healthy relationship. I want to be in an honest, open relationship. Open in terms of information, not open with partners. Yes, um, ma'am. And, but yet when we're engaged long-term in snooping behaviors, we're avoiding the real work of developing the skills needed for healthy, mature, satisfying relationships. We're going through the back door instead of learning how to go in the front door. And I think it goes, I always say this, but I'm going to qualify. It goes without saying, and I'm certainly going to say it, you know, if we unfaithful would just gladly, would you agree that if we unfaithful would gladly surrender passwords and surrender our phone records or surrender our phone or any of that, would you agree that if we were to do that, that that would even help alleviate most of the need for the betrayed to have to try and snoop? Yes. Part of recovery is learning how to live above suspicion, living transparently, honestly, in integrity. I love that. I love above recovery. suspicion. I love that, Jill. It's right? phenomenal. Above suspicion. Say that again. It's beautiful. Part of recovery is learning to live above suspicion. And so there's a straightforwardness, directness, openness with that. 
So absolutely, I agree with you. When those in recovery who have engaged in unfaithful behavior are practicing and learning the tools and skills of living in that way, which is in full integrity, yes, it does nothing but good in a relationship, right? right? And at the same time, I can hear the betrayed saying, yeah, but that's not how he or she is living. Totally. And I have proof and he or she has actually done this or they've admitted it or they've disclosed this to me. Therefore, there's this justification that gets queued up that we need to be really cautious of does not slide into a long term pattern Mm. of feeling justified and snooping. Because that is not going to get people in either direction. Ongoing unfaithful behavior certainly is not the recipe for a healthy relationship, nor is ongoing snooping. Because people are avoiding real intimacy of turning toward their partner. In a healthy, trusting relationship, we are able to turn toward one another for our primary needs. When a relationship is in distress one or both parties are turning outside the relationship to self-soothe or get primary needs met. That's exactly right. And I think turning towards each other, we could, we could talk about that for hours. Right. And in the information that you had shared with me, um, the prolonged snooping and the effect that it has on the snooper, here's some of the things that you've talked about. I'll just tee it up easily so that you can talk about them as you, as you'd like, but Stress levels remain elevated, right? They're in fight or flight or in high gear, which I love that verbiage. Cortisol levels stay elevated in the body, which negatively impact metabolism, sleep, and the nervous system um, and their ability to even settle. I mean, you're describing most betrayed, you know, just in those three active trauma symptoms and hypervigilance. And I like this one, right? The risk of additional trauma is heightened because the snooper is at high risk of directly encountering images or messages that are distressing. I mean, those are just a few. So, I mean, the ability for you to describe these is so easy for you, but isn't this just continuing to harm them by doing this? Yes, it will keep it now. There's two coins to this. In the short term, if someone comes across or one day has a hunch and they look into something, they find evidence of an affair, let's say, then acting on that with clear and rigorous boundaries or really getting intervention and help, it could be argued, hey, that was a good thing, right? I really want to keep coming back to when it becomes a pattern, it's chronic. This is what we're focused on. It will keep people stuck in a trauma cycle. It will keep them in a young ego state. I believe also it will keep people in anxious attachment patterns. And for those dealing with love addiction, boy, this is the way to keep that just spinning for years to come. Right. So it's I I work exclusively with the betrayed Sam and, and as an advocate and a a spokesperson, if you will, for for those that I see that aren't in a position to speak publicly like I can in forums like this, I'm sharing this message in an effort to care and support healing in betrayed adults. That's a painful, painful, searing, stinging situation to be faced with. And there's certain things that can help and hurt. In social media, especially in the last two years, I've been very troubled by messaging around snooping, strictly being a safety-seeking behavior, and we need to just back off and let him or her do it. Mm -hmm. To me, that signals someone that does not understand where this goes long-term. Right now, with the best of intentions, I think some of that messaging is trying to validate people on the very front end of this. Fair enough. But long term, this will not help full and deep resolution of trauma. It also will not help relationships heal long term, either the unfaithful behavior or ongoing snooping. It just it doesn't. It just won't. And your research, you said this, excuse me, off camera. 
You said that in one of your maybe conferences or intensives, you had actually done some real-time research that was pretty fascinating with actual survivors of betrayal. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, last month, I was had the privilege of participating in the SA Lifeline Conference, a virtual conference, and we were able to do real-time live polls of those that participated. And so out of 42 respondents to the poll that I issued online, 40% said that they had engaged in snooping for years. Hmm. Another 31% said they had engaged in snooping for weeks. So what that tells me is 71% of betrayed adults that were polled admitted to engaging this in a chronic pattern over a period of time. The, the highest number, the highest amount was for years. And then it went down from there. That really made my heart sad to hear that because that's years of traumatic stress. That's years of being in a relationship where you don't trust the very person you're, you're beside. And so instead of getting to the questions that are uncomfortable to ask of why am I staying in relationship with someone that I fundamentally to my core don't trust, it, it keeps people in an avoidant indirect pattern of living. That really takes a toll. Now, the other thing I learned is I asked people, do you believe snooping, if you engaged in it, was negatively, it had a negative effect on your betrayal trauma healing? And 40% agreed with that statement. So 40% said, yes, this had a negative impact on my healing. And 17% strongly agreed with that. So again, that's 57. If we combine those, the majority said snooping had a negative effect. But I don't think people are getting that message in social right. media and therapy offices. If they're just being told it's okay, hands off, she, she or he's doing this because they're safety seeking, and we're only turning to the unfaithful to fix this, we're, we're missing some therapeutic traction in a big way. When I asked people, what were the most extreme way, steps you took to snoop? I want to share some of these answers. I'll just share three that stood out to me. Conversing with formerly hired prostitutes skipping work to search the house, driving long distances to see where he was. And then there's many, staying up late to sneak through devices, spying, et cetera, et cetera. This really affects quality of life, Sam. And, and so I have compassion and heart for this because I just know people are not going to heal unless we really get to the core dynamic. Now, there's other research that also shows, and I know this may evoke some strong reaction. But at the University of Houston, they actually did a study in 2015 on snooping. And what they found was that people that are anxiously attached, they have an anxious attachment style. That means they have great fear of abandonment. Those are the people that will tend to really cling and dig in their heels into a relationship, even if it's toxic or maybe even killing them mm. uh, emotionally or spiritually. It showed that people that have anxious attachment are more likely to feel jealousy and are more likely to snoop. So I would invite people that are really stuck in this pattern. You can do free assessments online. The Attachment Project gives an excellent free attachment style survey. Do that and see where you fall. Are you more avoidant or are you more anxious? If you're anxious, you're going to want to work with a therapist to help you identify where that anxious style of attachment comes from. And I want to be clear, an anxious style of attachment does not cause betrayal. Right. Does not cause betrayal. But in the wake of betrayal, an anxious attachment style can keep someone stuck in very traumatizing circles that aren't going to allow them to heal. So I, my invitation is for adults to consider and contemplate what is the true effect that snooping's having on them? Is that over-functioning and really doing the work of the unfaithful? What I mean by that is it's the unfaithful's job to be forthcoming and bringing this truth forward. If he or she is not doing that, why? And how are you? Let me ask you this. So, you have said that a couple of times, if the betrayed is in a relationship with someone where they feel like they 
have to do the snooping, you know, to ask themselves, why are they in that relationship? So when you have a betrayed who would say, if I don't snoop, I don't get information. If I don't do this, I don't get the info. How do you help that betrayed? And I, and obviously we're not going to unpack this. It would take a while, but if, if there's a few key points of a betrayed male or female who are listening and watching and saying, okay, look, I get the data. I get the, I get what you're saying, but if I don't get information, he or she won't give it to me. So what do I do? What are just a couple of quick points to help the betrayed with that practically? Sure. I always want a betrayed adult or someone who suspects they may be betrayed to be safe, sexually, spiritually, physically, emotionally. And so what I say to people is declare very openly and directly your expectation and need to be in an honest, trusting relationship. Say it. I expect and need full honesty in our relationship. Now, someone may be laughing in the background right now saying, well, yeah, that's obvious. But I is it? Is it? Have we really made that need known? Someone may say, well, that's so obvious. That's like saying the sky's blue. Okay, but de declare it, say it, and then live up to that. Ask questions directly. Set boundaries. If you really believe, if your gut's firing, of course, I don't want people putting themselves in harm's way or engaging in things that they don't feel right about whether that's sexual relations or making a big life plan, you know, starting a family or of course not set boundaries to keep yourself safe until you're starting to feel like someone is being open and honest with you. And if they're not, if someone says, yeah, but I, I'm continuing to not feel like he or she's shooting straight with me. Okay. Let's look at that pattern closely. Why? Why am I chronically feeling like we're not in a straight shooting relationship? And what are we doing to address that? So it, I'd want people to ask themselves at what point, and this is individual, everyone has a different threshold for this. At what point do we say enough? I can no longer continue as we've been doing feeling like I have to creep around or snoop and, and spy on phones and devices in the middle of the night to get, to get the answers. And so it keeps people in this young, well, she didn't ask the right question. So I didn't cough it up. Uh, he's not giving me the information. So I'm going to check his phone at two in the morning. How old are we when we're living that way? Right. That's not all adults. Absolutely. It's not adults and it's not an environment that caters to restoration. Correct. And, you know, I would add to the betrayed. If you're in that situation, you've got to have somebody that you're working with individually. Because a, a couple's therapist or a couple's coach is not enough if you're dealing with that type of a scenario. And that person is so vulnerable and needs someone to help bring them back down to reality and, and reintroduce them to what is true and what is not, because they've probably been getting gaslighted. They've been lied to time and time again. They keep uncovering information where the betrayed goes, I don't know what to believe anymore. And it's so harmful. It's, it's in fact traumatizing to the betrayed. And you've alluded to that because they do have to ask themselves, why am I still here when this keeps happening to me. So I want to transition to something that you talked about with me off camera and what are better, better, more effective strategies to get information? I mean, we've talked a little bit about do's and don'ts. We've talked a lot about validating the experience of the betrayed. And I've thrown a few comments out for the unfaithful that they have created this mess. This inevitably gets brought up, whether it be by CSATs or regular therapists, or even by just unfaithful or betrayed. And some unfaithful will throw it out and I applaud them for it, but they will talk about the use of a polygraph. So what are your thoughts on that? I am a supporter and proponent for careful use of polygraph. I don't ever want polygraph testing to replace one's gut, but I do see and encourage the use of that as a tool amongst many to be a resource for couples. When used wisely, it can be a gift for both partners. I really believe that. 
it allows the unfaithful to give a gift of honesty and transparency that is unique, and it allows the partner to have her gut reinforced and confirmed. But we don't want polygraph to be abused. I have seen that or misused. And you want someone that ethically is administering that, has lots of experience in what we call single issue testing or fidelity testing, not just a random polygraph. Right. So it, it can be used, but we, when polygraph is introduced, we certainly want that weaned off of, or even if it's used and chosen by a couple long term to help with living above suspicion, that it be periodic and it's not being um, misused or used too much. I, I really feel strongly about that, but it can be a tool, especially on the front end of recovery work where a partner may not feel connected yet to her gut or his gut. Um, it, it can be useful. And I think also full therapeutic disclosure is a key thing to prepare for. Put those questions, put those wondering suspicions into quality questions and start doing the trauma work to get ready and prepare for learning the full truth, but also what are what are they going to do with the full truth? Sometimes people are snooping, but when I ask them the question, are you prepared for what you may find? What preparations have you put in place if you really need to leave or seek a divorce or separation? Are you ready for that? Most times, Sam, the answer is no. They've been spinning and, and snooping, but not actually putting it into action that lets them do something with the information if they were to find it out, which that then sets people up for just more secondary trauma. They've now just found more proof, but now they're just in crisis and there's no foundation beneath them. So I, I believe people are deserving of the truth, but there's healthier ways of getting the truth and disclosure, polygraph, you know, open, direct conversation and learning the skills to be able to be vulnerable and truthful with one another. Um, is really the direction I want couples to go if they're choosing to reconcile or restore. So when a betrayed is wrestling with, okay, I snooped and I found out more info than I wanted. And now I have all of this stuff ruminating in my mind and they've got pictures, word pictures, all kinds of stuff. As we kind of wind down, what? how do you help them with that? Because that is an epidemic where the betrayed male or female, they find out far more than they wanted. And some would say far more than they needed. How do you help them with that? What are a couple of suggestions that you could make for the betrayed that are wrestling with that level of information? Well, we know that the majority of betrayed adults will tend to isolate and so my first step is to get support, to reach out either with a betrayal trauma specialist, a 12-step group, a sponsor, somebody. Don't sit with this alone. It, it can really drive people crazy and it's traumatizing. So get the trauma support. And with that support, start building out a plan of action of what is the next right thing to do to respond to that. And often there may need to be space. There may need to be a therapeutic separation or some sort of space to digest and really come to terms with what we saw, heard, or found out. Um, but that's where I think good support can help people more objectively navigate that. Right. Because the type of support that a betrayed needs is specific to the betrayed's journey. And a, a couple's therapist or coach can help immensely but that betrayed, as well as the unfaithful, need their own independent, safe place, right? It, mm -hmm. They have to be able to process the weight of this traumatizing information in a safe way without the unfaithful there who can be reactive, who can be sometimes even intimidating, or they might wallow in shame. And then they're, they're, the betrayed feels like they have to focus on taking care of the unfaithful rather than taking care of themselves. Am I right? Correct. And, and let's be clear, too, that some of, well, there's a good portion of unfaithful behavior that treads very deeply on abusive dynamics, gaslighting, deception, emotional and psychological abuse, and, and physical harm, right? STDs, whatnot. So to have support that's also aware of some of the more sinister um, and dark sides of this, this isn't just, oh, their feelings have been hurt. 
uh, because of flirting, right. right? This this can get dark pretty quickly. And so I, I'm an EMDR uh, therapist, which is a, a evidence-based trauma modality. And it's common, Sam, after disclosure work that we start going into more deeper trauma work and even do EMDR targeting around things that were seen or heard or found out. So, um, yeah, it, it is, it's a process. It is possible. And right. I, I, but my, my primary invitation today is for those out there listening who may be engaged in snooping patterns right now, please know you are deserving of truth and honesty, and there's healthier ways to get that. And there's also a point where there's enough. I don't believe it's necessary to know every single thing that's gone on in order to heal. We need to know enough information to be in reality and to make wise, informed decisions, but to get support, don't do this alone. Um, and I, I want to validate the pain that goes into this for both parties, right? Uh, the, these are distressed relationships on multiple levels. And so for, for both people to get support and to unpack this. Again, I'm not making a false equivalency between unfaithfulness and snooping, but they both do harm to individual well-being, spiritual well-being, and relational well-being. All of this is trumped by the fact that you deliver it with such a compassionate, kind, and understanding demeanor. And I know every betrayed, male or female, would say, yes. Jill is so kind in the delivering of her information because that's what the betrayed needs. They might even be wrong or they might be out of balance, but if they have someone kind and gracious understanding the enormity of what they're dealing with, it makes everything just a little bit easier. And for those of you that are watching and listening, uh, Dr. Manning has provided a handout that I have in my hands on the impact of snooping. We talked a lot about it today, but there's still some really cool graphs that we don't have time to go into. So if you would like that handout, leave a comment. You can message me at Sam's Healing Podcast at gmail.com. I'm happy to email you that PDF. And then Jill, for people... You are in Colorado and you don't work with people out of state, but you do do intensives and you have a really phenomenal website. So why don't you tell people just a little bit about your intensives and then some of the free stuff that you have on your website before we say goodbye? Sure. Uh, so I do provide one and two day intensives. So that's six hours or 12 hours, respectively, of one on one in person therapeutic time with myself at my office in Colorado. And that is I, I created intensives for those that wanted to work with me that lived out of state and perhaps didn't have access to a betrayal trauma specialist locally. Uh, people can go to the appsats.org website to search for betrayal trauma specialists in their local areas or even internationally. But I do provide intensives and I also have digital downloads, uh, a third of which are free that provide different skills and breakdowns of, of trauma healing uh, tools on my website. Awesome. As always, I'm thrilled to have you in. It's always a great joy, but it's always massively educational when you come in because you're not just rattling off opinions. You're, you're bringing true data to the discussion. And so on behalf of myself and the audience, we're incredibly thankful for you coming in. If I can help you, if you have questions or comments for me, you can leave a comment on any of the platforms that you find Sam's Healing Podcast. Or again, you can email me. That email is Sam's Healing Podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to check into Jill's, Dr. Jill Manning's intensives, what's the website again for the intensives? DrJillManning.com. Simple and easy. Thanks so much, Dr. Manning. It's always a pleasure. We'll see you next time on Sam's Healing Podcast. Thank you.